please give a warm Georgia Tech welcome to our guest, Mr. Dan Myers. So Hazel, I have to tell you, you did ophthalmology better than most people do it after 10 years in the industry. That was very good, very impressive. You'd be amazed how many people can't pronounce the word ophthalmology or ophthalmics. Thank you for the opportunity to be here today. I, uh, I can assure you there's probably about six professors in the former management school, were they living today, would think this was an impossibility that I would be up coming back to Georgia Tech and speaking to a group like you. Matter of fact, they'd be probably thinking, did he ever graduate? And, uh, and it's with great honor I get to come back to talk to people who have done some of the things that far beyond my educational experience at Georgia Tech into your postdoc post and some of your PhD work. So very impressive and I applaud all of you. Uh, to the Williams family, it's an honor today to give this lecture on behalf of your, uh, in honor of your father, grandfather and husband. And uh, Dean Olive, I really appreciate this opportunity as well. I think it should be noted by some of you to realize that when people like Mr. Williams and Mr. Scheller feel the need to come back or feel the obligation perhaps in some case and give such generous gifts to this school. It must say a lot about what they thought they got here and what benefit they received from coming to a school like Georgia Tech and I can tell you while in no measure have I been able to give back to that level of what they've done, what I received here from Georgia Tech I have a similar debt of gratitude. Uh, I never dreamed when I was going into business what I had learned here and how it would benefit me over the years. And so today I hope, as I talk to you, maybe not as much about business strategy, about market planning. I know you have various areas of interest in this audience today. I hope to share more with you about my experience at Georgia Tech, what I think I learned here in retrospect, and then how it did leverage into who I became as a person, and also how it helped me as a businessman going forward and starting a company like Alamira Sciences. To do that, I think I need to start out with a quote that if you'll allow me to, uh, around the, the topic of my talk, when, when um, uh, Doris, uh, uh, Dory called me and said, what do you want to name your talk? I really didn't have a name for the talk, but it came to me fairly quickly. I've named this talk The Arena. And as you can see, it's because um, most of my life has been in the arena. Uh, I've won some, I've lost some, but I've always, for the most part, been in the arena. And I've enjoyed that. I've enjoyed the pressure of it. I've enjoyed the opportunity to succeed. Sometimes I've learned more by failing, quite frankly, than success. But I've always felt that being in the arena is where I belong. And I found very young, at a very early age, what I was good at. And that would be my first challenge to you is many of you know where your strengths and weaknesses are now. You're starting to understand who you are and where you fit. Really need to now try to leverage what you know you're good at. And I found out very early... I was good at leading people in the arena, and I, be, I believe I've been able to uh, accelerate that through my life and use that in leading people. There's a quote that I use for many, many years, probably the last 25 years, that I'd like to start my talk with, and if you just indulge me for a second, this quote was from a speech made over 100 years ago, but it will tell you a lot about who I am, how I see the world maybe, how I see competition, how I see achieving in the world of business, and mainly how I see life probably. And it goes like this, so listen to these words for a moment. It's not the critic that counts. It's not the person who points out where the strong ones stumbled or where the doer of deeds could have done better. The credit belongs to the person who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred with sweat and dust and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs and comes up short again and again, who knows the great enthusiasms, the great devotions, and spends themselves in a worthy cause, who at best in the end knows the triumph of high achievement. But at worst, in the end, if they fail, at least they fail while daring greatly. So their place will never be with those cold and timid souls who know neither victory nor defeat. 1910, President Theodore Roosevelt, in a speech, an excerpt from a speech he gave in Paris, France. And I think that speaks to all of us sitting here, certainly most of the people I know well. In some ways, we all want to achieve it may be in academia, it may be in athletics, it may be in our personal life, it may be in relationships. We want to achieve, and in some perfect world, we'd like to overachieve. We, we like to compete in some ways. We don't always acknowledge that or understand it, but that's part of why we go every day do what we do, is to achieve. And you do that by finding the arena that you're good in, 
arena that makes a difference either in your life or other people's lives, and then strive valiantly to get better and better at that. And that's really the core of what I'd like to speak to for the most part today, because I think a lot of what's successful in business has nothing to do with your MBA. I can't tell you the number of smart MBA students I've had come work for me at different places, and a lot of them have gone on doing very well, and some of them just stayed a very good MBA student. And I think the difference is a lot of what I've talked about just here in the first few minutes and what I hope I share with you during the course of the, of the remaining 30 minutes or so that we're together. Well, this was my arena. You may even may recognize this, right? You don't recognize this version of it, I bet. This is a little tired version. This is, uh, this is Grant Field, circa 1971, 1972. If you'll notice back there, there's no Buckhead in the background. There's no Midtown. Thank God, that would have been another place for me to get in trouble. Uh, this is where I played football for Georgia Tech, 1972, 1973, 4, and 5. So this was my first real big arena. And I had the distinction of being able to play here, and I also played quarterback for the 74 team. Was most valuable player of 1975 team. I show you that picture because you know that can't be photoshopped. Who would possibly photoshop hair like that, right? <laughs> so that really is me. My wife looks back and says, ah, yeah, that was you, wasn't it? You know? Hair's a little grayer now, maybe a few more pounds. But those experiences have, have done a lot for me in helping me share with you some of the things that I've learned while I was here in my Georgia Tech experience. And it wasn't just football. This is something I'm remembered for, and a lot of reasons I'm here today is because people remember my days as a quarterback there. And those were great days, great days. I mean, to be able to get to that level of play and play at that level. But to really understand my Georgia Tech experience, I think you have to go back to how I got here, not so much how I left here, okay? Um, I was one of those athletes in high school here in Atlanta uh, that in this crazy world I have today of recruiting is insane. All these five stars and guys go on TV and all that crazy stuff. Back then, they didn't have stars and all that. But if you were to rate me, if you were generous, I was probably a four star. If you're honest, I was probably a three star. My mother probably thought I was a five star, but that's about all. But I had enough, enough opportunities that I could choose between quite a few different schools. And so I had narrowed my choice of going to play football at either Georgia Tech or the University of Florida. Those are the two that I had to whittle it down to. I want to tell you in just a couple of minutes the experience I had in getting recruited by both those schools and what led to my decision, because obviously you know the answer to that, but the experience of doing it I think is important. Now for the, for the women in the room, I want to ask your indulgence. This takes place in 1971, okay? Sexism was far more rampant today, so please don't be offended by my story. I hope you'll indulge me just that. Here's how you get recruited at the University of Florida. The plane lands in Gainesville. The coach who's assigned to the Atlanta area meets you there and says, you know, welcome to, to, to Gainesville. We're going to be a game this weekend. I don't remember who they played. I think it was Florida State, actually. But also next to him is a young lady, and let's call her Mary for the sake of this discussion. But she's better known as a gator getter. Real, seriously, you're not, I'm not kidding. A gator getter, a, literally a gator getter. Well, what Mary's job is to do is to take you around the university campus for the weekend, show you all the great restaurants and sights and sounds, sit with you at the game, take you to the fraternity and sorority parties at night, and convince you basically that since you're clearly going to be an All-American, which I'm happy to believe at that time, all the girls here, the co-eds, they're going to swoon over you. And life in Gainesville will be palm trees, sun, co-eds, and football. Probably not even in that order, okay? And yeah, if you want to go to class, you can do that too, but that's not going to be a big part of it. Well, at 17, that sounds like a good deal. And I said, I'm in. And on Sunday, I committed to go to the University of Florida. I signed a letter of commitment that wasn't officially binding, but in my mind, I was going to go to the University of Florida. I get back to Atlanta, and guess who's sitting in my driveway talking to my mom and dad? It's the recruiter from Georgia Tech, Coach Dick Beswick who coached here for quite some time, coached at Virginia, later coached at Georgia, actually. Wonderful man, a mentor to hundreds of players throughout the Southeast, and a wonderful, wonderful person. And he had kind of gotten wind that I was going to go to Florida. And he said to me, he said, Danny, Danny back then, if you go to Florida, I'm sure you'll be a great player, and I'm sure you'll do fine. He was a great recruiter, because listen to what he said. He said, and if just going to play in Saturdays in a big stadium, and football's what's driving you, and you know, chasing girls on the campus, and son, I'm still trying to figure out what's bad about this. But anyway, he says, then you should go to Florida. 
But if you think you might be thinking a little beyond just school and you think you're going to be in Atlanta, you've met all these successful businessmen, football players and basketball players who've gone on to run companies in Atlanta, lead businesses in Atlanta, take, take a Georgia Tech degree and do something with it, you might want to give that consideration. And he said, I know it will be stronger, it'd be a bigger stretch for you academically to go to Georgia Tech. And quite honestly, there aren't that many girls on campus. But if you really want to think beyond just those four years, I'd encourage you to reconsider and think about staying in Atlanta because over time, that will be a better network and that will mean more to you and you'll make a better decision. Now, I can't tell you what went through my mind to make me think about that, but somehow over that evening, it did occur to me that maybe the tougher road was the right road. And the next day, I sheepishly called Florida and said, I'm not coming to Florida. I'm going to go to Georgia Tech to the delight of Coach Bestwick, my mother, and my father. And the following fall, I enrolled at Georgia Tech, and I got here, and I realized two things Coach Bestwick had said were absolutely true. The school was much harder than I thought it was going to be, and there were no girls. <laughs> and I have to tell you, as I stop at this point before I move on, how delighted I am to look at this audience and see the number of women in the audience and having two young granddaughters and two nieces who still are to make their college decision, the fact that now Georgia Tech is such an opportunity for women and the enrollment now I think is now half and half basically, which is just wonderful. And I really applaud the women here who've made this choice to experience the Georgia Tech uh, academic uh, journey. So I go to school and I go into the first week and everything Coach Bestwick said was right. Calculus was far harder than I thought it was. I call my father after about the third day and say, Dad, I'm in trouble because I don't even understand some of the questions they're asking, much less the answers to some of the questions. And I knew right away if I was going to get through Georgia Tech, it was going to be through going to class, studying, going to study hall, maybe get a tutor. But I was going to have to work very, very hard to get through Georgia Tech. And so I learned something in my first year here at Georgia Tech that I'm going to challenge you because this will be a challenge for all of you going into business or going into what other endeavors you go into because you're coming from a school that's known for its intellectual rigor, for its academics, and you're likely to think you might be the smartest person in the room. I knew from the day I got here that I would never be the smartest person in the room. And I want to challenge you to understand you may not always be that person either. And here's the kicker though, that's okay. Matter of fact, in my world, I've rarely been the smartest person in the room. I've gone on to, to start three other divisions and, and started Alamira. I'll talk about it a little later. I've been the CEO or president of a company for 20 years. And I can tell you, rarely if ever, am I the smartest person in the room. Almost never am I the smartest person in the room. And that's okay. Now, I may be the decision maker. I may be, because of my gray hair and experience, the wisest person in the room. I may be the person that's created the vision that we're trying to understand what we're going to do. But remember, if you're going to be successful in business, and you're going to be successful even in life, surrounding yourself with people smarter than you is okay. There's nothing more, uh, I can't think of the right word, pitiful, if I could say, to watch someone in a room who desperately needs to be the smartest person, and they're either bluffing or they're trying too hard to be that person. Don't be that person. Okay? And it's easy to come out of a school like Tech and think, that's what I've always got to do because the smartest person's the one most respected. I've always been surrounded by people smarter than me. The second observation I would give you that I learned in my first year at Georgia Tech is I'm very proud of the fact that Georgia Tech does not have, and I hope it's still the same, I can't say that I know this, athletic dorms. When I was told we would come here, you're not going to be over in some zoo over here where we keep all the athletes. Okay? You're going to be living in the dorms with just everyday people. In my first year, I was over at Howell Dorm, right there on 85. I could see the varsity from my room. And the first day before all of the students were coming to class, you know, remember the athletes had been on campus for two weeks. We had two-a-day practices. So we've already been here getting ready for the first game. And now all the, all the other students are coming in for the first semester. And Coach Dick Bestwick, who, the coach I referenced earlier, he's our freshman coach. And he said to us, he brought us all in an auditorium very similar to this, about 55 of us. And he said, starting tonight, when you go back to your dorm room, there's going to be a lot of other students in the dorm with you. Some of these students are going to be what you un uh, uh, unfortunately called in high school the nerds and the geeks of the school. They're going to be your neighbors going forward. And yeah, you're going to be the macho jock, and you're going to be the big man on campus, and people are going to look up to you because you're a football player. But he said, here's what I encourage you not to do. Don't do that. Now, he was clever the way he said this. He said, because one day, gentlemen, I assure you, you will probably be working for those people. 
It was a clever way to say to a bunch of big, bruising, broody football players, be nice. Be nice. And that's exactly what occurred to me when I started meeting these people. I learned at age 18 a very valuable lesson that I don't think I could have learned if I hadn't been at Georgia Tech in this environment in athletics. I started living in hallways with people who didn't look a lot like me. They were, they were different than me. They thought different than me. First time I went to an all-white high school, first time I had a chance to play football and, and, and get to know African-American guys and get to know that they see the world differently than me. And so right away, I learned lesson number two within my first year, and that is treat everyone with respect. I capitalized everyone because I mean everyone. I don't want to pat myself too much on the back today, but I would hope if you went to any company that I've either run or the one I started and said to employees, does Mr. Myers treat everyone equally? I hope they would say not only that, he cares about everyone, he knows our kids' names, he knows my husband's name, he knows where I went to school. Because see, it's easy, it's easy to fraternize with the CFO. I need him, I mean, he's helping me run the books. It's easy to hang out with the R&D guy because he is important to me. How about the receptionist who's got a high school education, sits in the front room, and she's the first person that the customer or the doctor or the business person coming in meets, and she is the face of our company. You think she's important to me? You think we need to treat her with the same level of respect we treat the PhD? Many of you will experience that. Many of you are going to be PhDs. There's a loftiness to that. But we need to treat everybody with respect. And when you do that in a company, if you're ever leading companies in the future or you're leading organizations, if you'll do that, then everybody buys in. Everybody's bought in. Everybody's got the vision because they know you care as much about them as you do these other people. I was a sales manager for about 10 years before I moved into general management. I used to tell our regional managers when they would hire sales reps, I said, when the sales rep comes to, for the final interview with me, I know they're going to treat me with respect. I've got all the power. I've got the ability to do this or this. They're going to treat me nice. I know that. But what I want you to watch for in the first month when you're out in the field and they're calling on doctors and we're trying to sell product in the hospital, so I know they're going to treat the doctor with great respect. They have to. That's their job. But here's the secret. I want you to also watch how do they treat the nurses? How do they treat the technicians? How do they treat the, uh, the uh, administrators? Because if they don't care as much about them as just the person who makes the decision, then they're not eventually the kind of people that we want to promote and that we believe can be great people in our company. So treat everyone with respect. So you can see for the first two years, the first year at Georgia Tech, so far I've told you nothing about athletics and I came to school on a football scholarship. I learned more at Georgia Tech in year one that had nothing to do with football. I learned a lot about academics and not worrying about being the smartest guy. I learned a lot about social skills and treating people well and treating them with respect and dignity because everybody has their own role and everybody thinks differently and it's okay. But I have to tell you, from the athletic standpoint, again, without bragging too much, it was going pretty well. I started as a freshman. I started as a sophomore. I played defense the first two years because we had an upperclassman playing quarterback, and I wasn't going to be able to play unless I played on the defensive side of the ball. He graduated, and they asked me if I wanted to come back over and play quarterback again. Well, who wouldn't sign up for quarterback over defensive back? So I signed up to go back to the quarterback side, going into spring practice, and I was the fifth guy on the depth chart. Fifth one. That was in, that was in April. By September, when the opening season started at Georgia Tech, I was the starting quarterback my junior year, 1974. And my first football game as quarterback at Georgia Tech was September the 9th, 1974, on Monday Night Football, national TV, against the defending champion Notre Dame Fighting Irish. My voice sounded like this in the huddle. That's a big deal, isn't it? I mean, remember back then, we didn't have cable and satellite and all that. This was the only game being played in America that night, and I was a starting quarterback for Georgia Tech. In my wildest dreams at Little Henderson High School, I couldn't have envisioned that. And yet here are the bright lights of Georgia Tech. We run out on the field behind that rambling wreck, and I just can't tell you the thrill. You'll, you'll just never know the adrenaline rush that is when you come out and you enter a contest like that. That is the arena. We didn't win that night. No, a lot of people didn't win that year against Notre Dame, but we played and had a decent season. The next year went even better for me. We won uh, a great majority of our games. We got a lot of injuries and tailed off at the end of the season, and I was voted the most valuable player of the 1975 team. My sisters have always said, you know what, you're just one of those guys that just, they said, you've, you've had a horse, you stuck up your, you finished the story. But maybe I was. Maybe it was that way. I'd always been in the right place at the right time. I'd always accomplished and I'd always achieved.
But the ultimate achievement athletically came for me the following uh, three months later when in the NFL draft, I was drafted into the National Football League. The dream every little kid when he's six years old has, right? The St. Louis Cardinals, they're now the Phoenix Cardinals. Full disclosure tells you in today's world I'd never be drafted. There was many more rounds back then. I was like the 400th player drafted. But I was drafted, doggone it, in the NFL. And somebody was paying me to play football. I was getting a check to play football. I'll never forget the first one I got. It had the Cardinal logo and my name on it. I thought, they're paying me to play football. That's pretty heady stuff. And I felt really big about myself. I was something. Okay? All you had to do was ask me. All right? And I played pretty well for a while. We had a couple of games I played well in. Got to play against Joe Namath and a couple other future Hall of Famers and big stage. But I began to realize at that level, people were even faster than at Georgia Tech and even bigger than at Georgia Tech, and the game was a little harder. And I began to slip a little. I had this sense that maybe it wasn't going so well. And that was confirmed when before one practice, one of the coaches came in and said, Dan, before you go to practice, Coach Coriel, Don Coriel was the older coach of the old St. Louis College, he'd like to talk to you. Well, I assume they weren't going to offer me a raise, right? And he called me in, and here's how that talk went. It's as visible right now as a video in my head. He said, Dan, well, actually, he called me Danny. Danny, if we had 40 guys like you, with your attitude and with your effort, we would be in the Super Bowl. That's good. You notice he didn't say anything about ability just then, did he? <laughs> he missed that part. And here's how my football career ends. This saga that I was just showing you ends this way. There's a flight to Atlanta at 1 o'clock and a flight to Atlanta at 3. Dan, which one would you like to be on? And with that, it's all gone. Since six years old, I'd been the best six-year-old. I'd been the best 10-year-old. I'd been the best 12-year-old. I'd been the most valuable player in football, baseball at my high school. I'd been the most valuable player. I wanted to say, y'all do realize that just six months ago, I was voted most valuable player, right? One o'clock, three o'clock, which flight you want to be on? Now, let me tell you, had that been it, if football was all I'd gone to college about, can you imagine the self-esteem, the fall that I would have taken emotionally? It would have been devastating. And it was devastating, be no, make no mistake about that. But the fact that I had listened to Coach Bestwick, and thank God he taught me into coming to Georgia Tech because I came out with something more than the ability to throw a football or run fast. And I had a degree from Georgia Tech, and now I was going to call him on this bit about, okay, let's hear about all these business people and all this network. Let's see all these alumni come flocking to me now. And I'll tell you that part of the story, but it leads me to the third point that I want you to remember, and this is about life, business, athletics, whatever. You have no guarantee of future success just because yesterday you were any good. I played in that stadium right down the street, and on one Saturday they're cheering me, and the very next Saturday the same people are booing me. What, wait, wait, last, year you took, last week I was good, right? And it's going to be that way in life, and especially in today's world where communication is so fast. You live in a communication world that I didn't even dream of, and the ability to stay ahead of that curve is going to be so much pressure, and you've got to keep expanding your mind, your skill set. You've got to keep growing. You cannot sit and wait for someone to realize what you used to be because it will just pass you right by. I was really lucky. I learned that at age 23 in a very humiliating, hard way. And I hope that happens to you maybe not quite so diff difficult, as difficult as I did. Well, anyway, I come back to Georgia Tech, and sure enough, what they said was true. I have found that the Georgia Tech degree means a lot in this city. I've also found, because I have businesses, I have offices in Paris, Berlin, Lisbon, and London, and I find even there you mentioned Georgia Tech and people know who you're talking about. We have a really fine reputation around the world, and you should be proud of that. You probably don't understand it yet, but you will. And sure enough, I started getting opportunities in business. I saw and met with people who were mentors, and I had some wonderful people that were old former Georgia Tech people, hopefully doing to me what I had the chance to do for you today. And I got into healthcare business 32 years ago after doing a couple other odds and ends things. I, I, and that's another thing, by the way, it's not in my slides. Don't worry about when you first get out if you don't want to do. I had no idea. But I found I was good at this, and I got in the healthcare business 32 years ago. Now, people tell me all the time, so you were in healthcare, you must have been studying to be a doctor. No, I went to Georgia Tech. And they go, how in the world did Georgia Tech prepare, prepare you to start Alamira? I said, I could answer it two ways. It did nothing to prepare me for it. And yet, just as easy as I could say, it did everything to prepare me for it. Because what I can share with you and some of the things we've talked about translate into leading companies, building companies, and running businesses. 
A lot of this stuff, folks, is not that complicated. It's not that hard. We try to make it harder. Consultants make millions of dollars creating a language to make it so much more difficult than it ever needs to be. My friend, our lawyers create language that makes it much more complicated than it ever needs to be. It's not that hard. A lot of these are fundamental things. So anyway, I go through a career with J&J, &J, as, as Hazel mentioned earlier. Got a chance to learn from a lot of great companies. And in 1996, I uh, was president uh, of a company called Novartis Ophthalmics. It was the third largest drug company in the world. I was running its ophthalmic division. And how I got into eye care, I don't have time to tell you today. Maybe at a, some other time or in a Q&A. But I'm running the, uh, the North American division as president of Novartis. And somebody walks into my office in 2003, or late 2002, I should say, and says, we've had a, uh, an overview of consultants have come in, and we've decided we're going to close your Atlanta business unit, and we're going to move everything to New Jersey. Now, I had 250 employees working for me here in Atlanta. I said, what are going to happen to those people? Well, some might be transferred. Some might have jobs. Some may not. This is the ugly side of corporate America, unfortunately. And uh, I said, well, what, 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 about, what about me? You know? Well, Dan, we're not going to have presidents anymore. We're going to have business units, and they're going to fold in. And, you know, he gave me all the gobbledygook about organizational structure. But basically, I got to a point where I said, but so there's no uniform for me? 25 years ago earlier when they said you can go home at 1 or 3, you mean I can't even get a uniform? My point is just what I said here, even 25 years later, as president of an international company, it can happen at any time, and you gotta be prepared to have the confidence to move on. And so that's how Alamira got started. I'm gonna show you a clip real, right now about our, our lead product called Alluvian. Alluvian is my greatest accomplishment, and if I don't do anything else in healthcare before I retire, to be able to say we got this drug through the FDA uh, two years ago, it's now approved in 17 countries in Europe, and as Hazel said, it's for the treatment of patients who have diabetes and are losing their vision. About 30% of patients who have diabetes will eventually have it progress to the point it can affect their uh, vision, and DME, as we call it, is the leading cause of blindness uh, in Americans. This is an implant that you put in the eye, it stays for three years, and it releases drug, and it improves the patient's vision in a great majority of the patients. I won't go any further with my bragging of it. I'll let you see what the media has been saying about it now for about the past year. Ramesh had several treatments, including steroid injections into the eye, which helped. But these injections need to be repeated every few months. Dr. Salar Kish suggested a new FDA-approved implant. The implant sits in the bottom of the eye so the patient won't see it and it releases medication for three years before needing a replacement. A device the size of the end of a paperclip 3.5 millimeters is changing the way doctors treat vision loss. Oh, I am. I'm very happy. Loretta Klein has been a diabetic for 30 years. Look down. One of her complications is called macular edema. And that's a condition where you get swelling in the retina and it can impair their vision. It's delivered in very low levels over a continuous period of time. Klein was the first to undergo the procedure. She says it was painless. And in just a minute, it's over. Klein's vision dramatically improved in just a month. Most insurance companies cover Alluvian, and now we're seeing it become a big hit among patients across the nation. Dr. Nancy Holkamp is the Director of Retina Diseases at the Pepos Vision Institute in Chesterfield. And when I talk about moderate vision loss, I'm talking about not being able to read clearly or drive unrestricted. Then last fall, the FDA approved Illuvia from Alamera Sciences, an implant that's long-lasting. And this is the first time we've had true long-term drug delivery for eye disease. It releases a steroid, and it's working for Joy. This scan was taken March 16th, when Joy received her first Illuvian injection in her right eye. The retina needs to be compact. These spaces are edema. It's fluid that's leaking out of the, the blood vessels because of the diabetic retinopathy. Now, that scan compared to a scan during this checkup five weeks later. She looks like this. One of the great things about this drug is it's absolutely going to reduce uh, uh, the leading cause of blindness from diabetic macular edema in the United States. 
For Charles, Alluvian has improved the quality of his life. And I don't have to get another injection for three years. That's pretty amazing. Meaning less time at the doctors and more time on the links. I'm Marty Salt reporting. Pretty cool, huh? We're extremely proud, and I'm very proud of the Alamere employees who persisted to the FDA for almost three years to get this drug approved. And there again, it's all about persistence and all about practicing what you know you can accomplish in doing. Here's our office up on Windward Parkway. We're right up off 400. This is our building, and I, I show you this only because for the first two months when I decided to start Alamere, I was the only person in this parking lot. I drove my car in and parked right there, and there was nobody else. I went up in that building, I sat right there in that building with a rocking chair, a clipboard, I mean a, a yellow pad, and a cell phone, and that's how Alamere was started. I called my dad and I said, Dad, I'm kind of tired of the big pharma thing, you know, I built this thing since 91 and they moved it to New Jersey, I'm out of a job, I don't know what I want to do, but I'm going to start a drug company. My dad said, my dad, you got to remember, I'm sorry, I didn't give you some background, 30 year sales rep for Pfizer. This guy is Mr. Non-Risk, okay? He said, well, do you have any products? I go, no, no, we have any products yet. He goes, do you have, do you, have you raised money? No, I've never done that, but I think we can go and convince people to do it. And do you have any employees? I said, no, I don't have any money, I don't have any employees, and I don't have any products. But here's also what I didn't have. And this is the last thing I'll share with you about what Georgia Tech taught me. I didn't have any fear. I was not going to let fear beat me at that point. And that is, to me, the single biggest thing that stops people from excelling in the arena. We all want to do well. We all want to hold the ball up, if that's the metaphor I can use. We all want to be celebrated, but we're afraid of failure. We're afraid of embarrassment. We're afraid of ridicule. It's just our human nature. There's nothing wrong with that. It's just how we're wired. And we have to overcome that. And the difference between the first time I couldn't get a uniform, when the Cardinals told me to go away, to the second time I couldn't get a uniform, when basically my whole company's moved to New Jersey, is I had practice practice and practice what I was about to do. I had built sales forces. I wasn't just a rookie anymore. I knew how to start companies. I'd never done it on my own. I'd never raised my own money. I'd use big pharma's budgets and so forth. The worst thing I could do there is fire me. This time I'd just go bankrupt. But the fear of failure never even occurred to me. I don't say that braggingly because it could have happened to me years early had I not practiced and practiced and practiced. And the only way you're gonna overcome fear is to practice. And I don't mean just what you do in school. Practice being on time in class and practice studying. Those things are so odd. But practice the way you think. Practice the way you see things and how you, mo how do you modify your behavior. Say, you know what, I tend to be negative sometimes. I'm going to practice being positive. Sometimes I'm too critical. I'm going to practice being encouraging. And I'm going to practice these things. So when it comes time that I need to use these skills, I've done it enough that fear doesn't overcome me. Does that make sense? Because that's a key, key part of any good business person's personality is fear does not inhibit them. That's a very big deal, okay? I'll finish with this. Anybody know what that is? Even if you have, somebody's played Madden football for goodness sakes, right? What is that? It's a football play. That's a design. That's a diagram. So here it is. This is this is the offensive guys. Here's the quarterback. Here's the running backs. There's the defense. And you notice everybody has a job. He blocks him. He blocks him. You hand it off. He goes for a touchdown. Simple. Here's here's another one. What's that look like? That's it's another play. That's a passing play, right? Here's the quarterback. He's looking this way. If they're covered, he goes to the other side because you got one on one coverage. You run a skinny post. You hit him. It's a touchdown, right? I used to have playbooks with. Pages and pages, hundreds of these that you had to memorize, and I, as a quarterback, had to know every single job of every single person on that board. Because when you get up to the line of scrimmage, if things don't look right, you want to change the play, obviously you have to know what everybody's doing to play, change to the right play. I know sometimes when you go to these games at Georgia Tech, it just looks like total chaos. Trust me, there's a lot more going on than you realize. But this is a football play, and I had to learn hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of these. What's the most common thing do you think? Some plays go to the right, some plays go to the left, some are passes, some are runs. What's the common element to each one of those plays that are diagrammed? They all go for a touchdown, right? They, every one works. They all, I mean, that one worked. The one I did before worked because he does this, she does that, he does that, he does, and it works. And you score a touchdown every time. And we practiced down there on Rose Bowl Field over and over and over and over and over again so that every time we ran it, we scored a touchdown. Now, how many have gone to a Georgia Tech football game and seen a touchdown scored on every play? Right? 
If you're really, really good, you might score about one every 10 plays, more like every 15 plays. Because what happens, as soon as the ball is snapped, all hell breaks loose. I raised almost a quarter of a billion dollars on this concept, telling investors and bankers, I don't know exactly how we'll build this company. But I can tell you this, I've got the experience and I'm willing to change and I'm willing to read a play and if it's not working, we will change. And we will change quickly and we will go in another direction. Investors and people will admire that about you more than this prideful, here I've got a plan and by golly, we're gonna run it my way and we're gonna do it this way. This is also life because I can assure you the people in the front row with a little more experience and those maybe in the group can tell you that's the way life works. It never, ever will go the way you plan. Relationships won't work the way you plan. Business will go bankrupt. You'll lose jobs. Children won't turn out the way you want. It, does, it doesn't work that way. I'm really sound like an old guy now, aren't I? And so what do you do? You have to adjust. And you have to have the confidence that what you're doing will eventually work, even though it may not be plan A or plan B or plan C, because it's never going to work. We do five-year plans basically just because we need to. And I always say, I know it's wrong, I just don't know how wrong it is yet. And we'll figure out quickly how wrong it is. And then the last thing I'll say to you is some of these things that change require you to make decisions that have nothing to do with profit and loss, businesses or grades. It has to do with a moral compass. It has to do with you developing in yourself the distinction of knowing what is right and what is wrong. Now, I'm not here to preach to you. I'm not a Bible scholar. I'm not a theologian. But I do know this. A part of my life has been that moral compass. There's just certain times when you have to rely on something that says, I know just through my spiritual nature, because we've, we've got a mind, we've got a body, but we've also got a spiritual nature. To Stephen Covey made millions and millions of dollars calling this your true north. That was a kind of a clever way to call it. Wayne Dyer, who recently died, made millions of dollars selling books, calling it your source, whatever your source is. I'm a kind of a simple guy. I just call it God. Hope I don't offend anyone with that. But having that sort of belief, my Christian faith has helped me to just have a moral compass. And I'm not suggesting it has to be right for you. But here's what I'll always say to you, and I owe it to you to say this. Give that a chance. Give it a chance to understand that there's a piece of you that's just going to have to override profit and loss and just do the right thing and have an ability to say, in my, in my spirit, I know this is the right thing and I have confidence to do that even if it's not popular. People will follow people like that. I, I guarantee it. So I started my talk quoting a very, very famous president. I'm going to end quoting a very unfamous person. Me, okay? <laughs> Here's how I see the world, and I believe this really boils it down to something pretty simple. It's worked for me. The world will embrace those who confidently know who they are. Not bluffing, not con men, con women. Someone who confidently has the assurance of who they are. That's that true north I'm talking about. They don't waver. They know what they stand for. They know who they are. They've also found where they excel. I got a real break on this one. I found out really early I could lead people in the arena. People would see my vision. People believed in me. People knew I would work as hard as they. They knew I'd respect them, and we were going places. And I've had that benefit for years that people would do that. And I learned very quickly what value I brought to organizations. I was never going to be the scientist. I was never going to be the mathematician or the finance guy. But I could be one of the people who led people, who brought people together, who encouraged debate. Half the time my job as a CEO now is just saying, talk about it. We're in a room. What do you think? What do you th and, have, and, and as they argue and discuss it, it piques thoughts. You go, you know, I hear you. Here's what we're going to do. Not that I was so smart about it, but I found that's what I did well. And then finally, finally, I would say just do it, but Nike stole that long ago. Finally, have the courage to just go for it. And that comes back to this whole aspect of fear. Don't let fear win. And you're only going to get there by practicing, having discipline, and doing things over and over that sometimes appear to be laborious, sometimes don't appear to make sense, but you are developing traits, you're developing character, and you're learning how you're going to be a leader someday and how people will want to follow you because you've become that person. 
it's a tremendous honor. I look in your faces and I just love to see the eyes of people looking and, and your, your enthusiasm, your youth. You're going to do great things. You're going to do things far better than I did. I'm going to be really enjoying watching tech people do these things. And everything they've told you about the Georgia Tech degree, take it from an old guy. It's true. And so I leave you with one thought. Forever we'll be sharing this comment, even as we go out. Go Jackets, right? Thank you. So, Dan, I have a question to start us off. And so you start up, or, or you're being entrepreneurial, right? That's so right. you've left your organization. And obviously, you've talked about, you know, don't be afraid of that failure. And I'm sure, right. I'm sure you're very experienced at failure. Um, and so, and so the, you know that? The, the, quest, the question is, is that, you know, can you, can, can you actually uh, give us an example of early on when you're being entrepreneurial, and you've 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 had a challenge or a setback, and how you pivoted or how you embraced that. Just just talk about that because there is a lot of entrepreneurial students in the room, and they would appreciate that insight. Are you specific around fundraising, or just as we started the company? Just it can be any. It can be yeah. a technical challenge. Yeah, or I, I think a, I think a, a real good turning point, and and maybe something that exemplifies what I was talking about here earlier, a little bit about the play changing you on you. When we started the company. Um, you have to understand, uh, and maybe many of you do, running clinical trials and developing drugs and getting through the FDA is a terribly expensive business. The Luvian product that we showed you up here, that cost $80 million to get through the FDA. And for small companies, that's a lot of fundraising. That's a lot of being on the road raising money. I started the company with no dream of ever doing that. It was too expensive. I was going to be a front of the eye company. You know how you go to these eye care shells and have allergy drops and they're all over the place, OTC. And that's what I was going to do because I didn't think I'd have enough money to spend all the money on these, on these high-priced trials. And so we launched three, three products in the front of the eye. You might have seen some of them on the shelf. One was called Soothe for dry eye. One was called Alloway for allergies. And we had a sales force out there. And we were just getting hammered in the marketplace by the bigger companies oversampling us. And we were just looking at that model saying, we may never make money at this. And so I had to make the decision. Are we going to sell this business? And I've got to go to the original investors and say, I was wrong. My plan will not work. We found a product that's an implant. It's for diabetes. It's for back of the eye. It's not even plan B. It's like plan E. But we think we can acquire it. We can, we're going to try to get it through the FTA. So we basically redesigned the company from being an OTC company to a retina company, a high-driving high R&D company we thought could have. Well, you can imagine those conversations with the original investors we're going to be pretty tense. But it was an example of if you don't pivot then before we lost all that money. And I got to tell you, the most amazing thing is I had about five really big investors. These were 10 and $12 million shareholders. And when I called them and said, I've got to be honest with you, I'm going to change directions here. Our plan isn't working. One of them was so great, he goes, man, is this good. I was waiting for a tongue lashing. And he said, when we invest in companies like you guys, nobody's plan A ever works. Because what I'm looking for is someone, when it doesn't, don't waste my money with your ego and continue to just bang the drum on something that isn't working, turn it another way. And we redirected the company, and that became Alluvian. So, you know, when you're, when you're in that entrepreneurial world, you, you know, if you're in big farm and you're in just some big lethargic company, you can just keep going and, and going because, you know, your, your job security is not really challenged. When you're an entrepreneur, you better figure out real quick if this isn't working, because you've got a limited amount of money, and there's nothing wrong with saying, I missed on this one, as long as you've got a plan B. And that's what I think investors look more for people who'll be honest with them and then have something where they can pivot and go to. And that may not be right either. In our case, it was a winner. In our case, we hit it. But that's an example I could give you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a question here. Um, so when you first started your company, you were talking about how you're sitting you know, in the office you know, by, by yourself. Um, when you, when you started off, what uh, did you like? Well, right now your company is focused on eye care. Right. Um, did you start off with that, or did you start off more as like a vague forest pharmaceutical company, and you didn't really know like what you want to specialize in? How did you get into the field of eye care? Right. Right. That was just serendipity. I actually I actually started in eye care in 1981. Actually, believe it or not, through placement here at Georgia Tech. I guess I should give a shout out to the alumni placement center because. 
the first job I got in healthcare came through the alumni placement center here. So it was really by just sheer luck that I started in ophthalmology. So I had been in ophthalmology for 30, well back then, maybe 20 something years. And so I knew I knew. The one thing I, I, I didn't get a chance to get into in the presentation is, is I knew I knew a lot of the doctors and I was, I was well known in the industry. So at this point, I guess what I was saying is all that practice I had talked about, you know, now is my chance to leverage it. I was, you know, I was 49 years old. I'd been in the industry 20 years. If I was ever going to use that to my advantage, I better strike now because they'll forget about me in two years. Just like I said, you have no guarantee of future success. So the ophthalmology piece for me, I had been in it a while. I will say this though, it's an interesting question because the, the retina space, everybody remember, you know, you got your cornea and then you got the vitreous and you got the retina, right? We got that much of the eye down. So drugs in the back of the eye have just become available in the last 10 to 15 years because we've never had a way to get drugs to the back of the eye. The, the eye repels liquid, and so that's why a lot of drops you take end up running down your cheek and down your nose. The, the eye was designed to repel. It's hydrophobic. Getting to the back of the eye requires a system, and so we developed an implant that you actually take the drug into the eye before you begin releasing the drug. So we cross the corneal barrier with a device and then begin the medication. So it's a totally different way to think about treating the back of the eye. Retina has become a booming area because if you look at the aging of America, you know, most eye disease, the blinding aspects of disease is associated with age. I mean, very few 25 year olds go blind due to some aging condition. So it's associated and as, as investors in 2003, and I'm expanding a bit on your question, but in 2003, remember what had just happened in 99, 2000, 2001, Big investment money had gone into what? Tech, IT. Remember the, if you're, you're too young may remember, the IT bubble burst. And companies that were worth 200, 300 million after two months were now worth, the, you know, the, the price of cash they had in the bank. So investors were running scared out of IT and out of the dot-com, you know, I guess it was known more as the dot-com bubble burst. So the thing about investments, if you need to remember, if any of you go out to raise money or any of you looking as entrepreneurs, remember one thing. It took me a while to figure this out. They make no money by holding the money. Got it? The only way they make money is by putting the money to use. They're going to put that money into your company or somebody after you or somebody after you. I started to realize I was making these presentations to venture capitalists like, wait a minute, I don't have to be the perfect company. I just have to be better than the other five guys who are going to follow me because the money is going to get deployed. Well, when you've just come out of the dot-com bubble and got hammered, you're really looking for another place to put your money because you have to put your money somewhere. Well, you know, again, I was very fortunate. I show up in 2003 with healthcare, retina, back of the eye, diabetes. I mean, everybody knows diabetes is going. So it was really a lot about where we were. You know, sometimes it's time and place, you know, but you got to be ready. Uh, so I, th I think healthcare was a hot spot there anyway, but ophthalmology more so because it's one of those aging population diseases. And right now the market is looking at drugs that treat the aging population because we know demographically we're headed towards uh, the baby boomers. I think there was a question behind you, Greg. I don't, oh, right here. Sure. Yeah. Dan, yeah, thanks for coming to Georgia Tech today, by the way. This is unrelated to the question I really want to ask. Was Steve Rabel on the team that you played on? He sure was. You're, you're the guy that threw the Rabel, right? I was. Yeah, I remember yes. that. I yes. used to go to those yes. games. By the, way, by, the way, by the way, Steve Rabel went on to play for the Seattle Seahawks. He was well, a number. He actually was very And now he does the announcing for him. I went out to see Steve about uh, two years ago, and he let me sit in the booth with him, and he did the Seahawk announcing. He's a great guy. Uh, Steve was, and he's in the Tech Hall of Fame. Yeah, but yeah, Steve Rabel played with me. Right, right. I think you're on the right track. I, I applaud that. I, I, I spoke to business plans almost, uh, maybe you detected it from me, almost in a negative. I, I, I spent 20 years in big pharma and, you know, these large companies where it was mandatory to have a five-year rolling plan. It was almost a joke within the company because you just, 
you just wrote, it's kind of like writing a play, like, well, I guess we'll show the guy scoring because he's supposed to score. And the same thing with business plans. I'm not a proponent of those. Now, I, I do think you have to obviously have a two-year budget. You have to be able to lay out the use of your capital. If you're going to ask people for money, the first thing you better have is use of funds. They're going to ask you two things right away if you're trying to raise money. Have you got any money in? Okay. And what's the use of funds? If I give you the money, what are you doing with it? Now, I don't think you get that from a business plan, so I agree with it. If you can show me a model, if you can show me a business model, it may even be conceptual at this point in time, and then go forth with the plan. So I would totally concur with how you're going. I don't think I could have raised a nickel by putting up a, a bullet point, three-page business plan. You know, uh, we put up a lot about what we were going to do, who we were. You know, a lot of venture capital money is betting on the past. They're not, by the way, if you ever go out to raise venture capital, some of you I'm sure will, you get this picture of the old Wall Street movie and Gordon Gecko. Who was the guy who played Gordon Gecko, honey? You know, uh, Michael, ja Michael Douglas, you know, and these, these kind of, they couldn't be further from that. These are the most risk aversive people you've ever been around. They will jump generally only when someone else has jumped. They come in more of the fear of missing the deal than leading the deal. So if you ever go out and raise money, and if you'd like me to expand on this for a moment, if you're raising money, the real key is if you go in and do your business uh, model and you do your presentation, if you ever, rather than go out and say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to find 20 guys or 30 people, and men or women, whatever, and I'm going to do a presentation, and I'm just going to keep doing it by the numbers, that will work to some degree. But the minute you find of one of those 20 presentations, hey, that person really resonated. I, you know, that one felt different. I think they could lead the deal because once you get the lead, it's amazing how the rest of the syndicate will come together. We got our lead. It took me like five or six months of pounding doors in New York to get my first investor. It took me three weeks to get the other five. I went from raising like $6 million in a company in Raleigh to $27 million three weeks later. So if you're out there talking to them, if you find that one, really cultivate that one. Because if you get a lead, you get that first one in the ground. The, the, the herd, it's a pack, trust me. It's a herd. So, but I totally agree with your, your assessment, yeah. Jim, more mm -hmm. What do you think the uh, admission of the NFL that uh, football is uh, related to uh, degenerative uh, progressive brain disease, um, what do you think that that means for the future of football, uh, both college and professional, as a part A question? And part B, uh, what kinds of entrepreneurial opportunities do you think um, this uh, presents? Huh? <laughs> no, no, I'm kidding. Uh, you can ask my wife about the concussion aspect of her. I told her, honey, it's, it's, it's just it's football's fault. I can't remember all these things because I got hit too many times. I, uh, uh, and actually, I, I, I make light of it. I shouldn't. I, I did suffer concussion here at Georgia Tech and was hospitalized up at Knoxville, Tennessee for several days. I didn't even make the trip home with the team. It's, a, it's a, an area that I do think we need to look more at, and I, and I do think it's irrefutable that long term. Now, I didn't play 25 years. You know, luckily, I'd never played that long. Matter of fact, I look back, it was probably a blessing that I got cut and did not play another 10 years in the NFL. I do think the NFL is going to have to take this seriously. And I think it does affect what we're going to see in some of the youth football and some of the techniques. It's real, and I think you're going to have to address it. Uh, I'd have to think a bit from the entrepreneurial opportunities that might come out of that. Um, uh, at this point in time, I can't think of what technology I would think, but, but I, I do think it's real. And um, uh, the game today, you know, I showed you that 1970 something old, old photo. The game today is so much faster and so much more violent than what I played in. And, I, you know, and of course, people say that I played in a time more violent than, you know, the 40s and 50s. The players are just so big and so fast. I, I don't want to get off on football too much, but. If any of you could go to an NFL game, if you have, and stand down on the field this close, the size and speed of these players, TV doesn't do it for you. Sitting up on the upper bleachers doesn't do it. When I got to the NFL, and that was years ago, and they're bigger and stronger now, I just couldn't believe how big and fast they were. And I thought tech was pretty fast, you know. Uh, so you can imagine those collisions, it just cannot be a good thing. So uh, as much as I love football, I'm not sure my children would play today. And that's always a question I get asked. I'm not sure they would. So. Uh -huh. uh, so my question is regarding 
uh, the experiences that you have had where you worked in a company for a long time and then you were out of a job and decided to go to build your own company, mm -hmm. uh, which is sort of like taking in the experience and then trying to produce something out of the experience that you've gone. Uh, for a lot of us, it's a hard choice to figure out when to start uh, an entrepreneurial right. adventure. Uh, so how do you draw that line between uh, absorbing enough experience versus starting to produce mm -hmm. uh, information and knowledge? Yeah, I guess in my case it was decided for me. I mean, I guess I could have done it early, but you know, I really had to get pushed to where I was uncomfortable to make that decision. I do advocate, by the way, uh, somebody in the session I had the meet and greet earlier asked me this question about, you know, as a PhD, would he be better starting a big pharma company and gain some experience or go right into? And, and as much as I would never be able to work in a big pharmaceutical company anymore, I'd rather just retire. I could never go back there. I did spend a long time, 15 years or so, in a bigger drug company environment. I don't bash big pharma for sport. I just say, there's a lot of things smaller entrepreneurial companies can do that are more life, life from a lifestyle and, and quality of life more enjoyable. And I think for the good of the industry, I think smaller, nimble, quick companies produce drugs faster, create greater innovation than these big, lethargic, monolithic companies. And, I, and I've worked in both, so I, I know from where I speak. Having said that, I wouldn't hesitate, if I'm coming out of a, a situation like you guys are in, to take a job in a bigger company to start with. I wouldn't, I wouldn't reject that and say, well, no, then I'm kind of selling out because I'm not a real entrepreneur. You know, I, I do think you benefit. I like to tell people, if you went up to Alamir and walked the halls right now of our employees, you'd see people who've come out of a big farm environment and they know how to run things like big pharma. We just don't. I used to be one of my fun lines when I was raising money. I'd say to you know, Mr. and Mr. Investor, I've run big drug companies. I know how to do that. I know how to run them like big drug companies. And if you give me your money, dot, 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 I promise never to do that. And I'd get this smile on their face because they're going, Dan, for a while there, you were never getting my money. The point being is we're in a highly, most industries today are highly regulated. I mean, if they're highly technical or, 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 or something to do with healthcare. And, you know, we're not making this drug in our garage. I mean, this is under sterile conditions. This is FDA approved facilities. I mean, you got to know what you're doing. And so a lot of the training that you get, in my case, in healthcare and big pharma, but it could be the same in tech. It could be the same in other places. You, you know your areas better than I do. There's nothing wrong with going there and learning that. The, the dilemma I find, and I know some people, and this gets back to my fear thing, to come back and harp on that, it just becomes a little bit intoxicating to be able to go to work every day and know I got a job and I've just kind of settled in and before you know it, you're 45 years old and you just, yeah, you know, I look back and, and that would be my only thing is to challenge yourself to say, I don't want to lose that spirit. Now, how do you do that? You go to, you know, you go to symposiums. You go to the, you, you meet other people, you network outside of your big pharma network, and you keep your, you know, you keep your contacts there. But, but I, I wouldn't advocate saying, well, I, I come out and I've got a great job offer from, in my case, J&J. &J. Take it. Learn a lot there. And, and, then, and, and I think companies like mine, when we get an application for a scientist or someone in finance, and, and they've worked at, you know, well, I should say Arthur Anderson, they're no longer around, but a big, a big accounting firm, and we need somebody in finance. We, we definitely are attracted to that person because we said, you know, we're a small company. We want to make sure someone's coming in with outside, outside set of eyes who are doing it in a big way and kind of keep us in track because, you know, entrepreneurial companies are great, but not if you run off track too much. So uh, I think you would be attractive to an entre entrepreneurial company even if you've been in a big, big environment. Dan, thank you so much for coming to Georgia Tech. Okay. Thank you.